So this question is about geosynchronous orbit. And I'll have to warn you that I'm using the term a little bit sloppily. I think in the aerospace engineering circle, there's a um, distinction between, uh, well, so I, I'm going to assume this is my situation. This is my setup. My Earth is here. And as we all know, Earth rotates. And we'll say that we have set up our coordinate system so that uh, the axis that Earth rotates around is directly up as a draw. And not worried about the tilt of the Earth for now. So Earth has an equator. And I'm going to imagine a satellite that has been put into space around the Earth so that over a whole day, um, the spot it's directly over on Earth is the same spot the, the, throughout the whole day. So when you think through it, the only part, of, the only kind of extension of the great circle through Earth where that can be done is uh, above the equator. Because if you're above any other spot, then as you're trying to get out orbit, um, you, you will be changing latitudes over time. So let me imagine my satellite somewhere here. So over a course of a day, the satellite will be orbiting the Earth. One full, uh, I guess it should be one full turn since, um, so <laughs> over one whole day, the satellite is directly over this spot on Earth. And over a whole day, this spot will be moving around the Earth one full turn. And the satellite will also be completing one full turn so that it's directly over the point throughout. That's the setup of the geosynchronous orbit. And again, um, there's like somewhat nuanced version of the term that <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> I think I've seen it once before and then forgot which is which. <laughs> we'll just use the term geosynchronous. It's asking, what is the altitude of the satellite? OK, uh, let's uh, first uh, work out the uh, uh, radius in the sense of the distance from the center of the Earth to the orbital height of orbital position of the satellite. Let me call that R orbit. And after, I work, after we work out that answer, we'll have to modify it a little bit. Because when it says altitude, it's really asking for this distance from the surface of the Earth to the satellite. And so there's a difference of the Earth's radius, which might be significant, might not be. We'll have to work out the answer to see. So uh, the hint says, <laughs> consider the centripetal force on the satellite and follow the standard strategy. OK, let me just uh, take this snapshot and draw a free body diagram. So I have the satellite there. There's always gravity. Now, uh, I'm not going to draw it downward because gravity points towards the center of the Earth, which in that snapshot is to the right. So there's going to be that gravitational force. And you think through, hmm, what other force is there? And after some thinking through, the answer should be no other force is there. It's, um, that's it. <laughs> this is the uh, one force that's on the satellite that's it's orbiting Earth. So, okay, and, and the kind of the mistake to make sure to avoid is not to use our usual uh, formula of mg. This is what's a valid near surface of Earth. And I have a sense that this is nowhere <laughs> near the surface of Earth. So we got to use the full version of gravitational force that we introduced this week which is that the universal law of gravitation says that the magnitude of gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses, the mass of satellite times the mass of Earth, and it's inversely proportional to the distance squared, or orbit squared. And to make the equality work, we need this gravitational constant, whose value is uh, can be looked at. Wolfram Alpha can do that for you. Uh, so this is our expression for force. And in using standard strategy, I'm skipping some of the steps because you know it's a simple setup with one force. Uh, where we should end up is writing out this expression, the 
acceleration is equal to net force divided by mass. So, oh, I, this is my net force. G times M big M over R orbit squared divided by small m. So those will cancel out. And because this is circular motion, uh, we know what the acceleration is in terms of kinematical quantity. Um, if we squared over r orbit, it's the same r as the this thing. <laughs> and I have a sense that this is not the most convenient expression. So let me rewrite it um, using the expression relating the tangential speed with angular velocity. Uh, I can rewrite this as r orbit times angular velocity squared. And let's see. Yeah, I, I think that's enough. Um, so let me just uh, write out a cleaned up version here, uh, equating the far left hand side with the far right hand side. So the cleaned up version says uh, r orbit omega squared is equal to g times big M, mass of Earth divided by r orbit squared. So we had to combine these two terms, right? And omega, this is a number I can work out in terms of all the known quantities, because um, what omega will be is it's 2 pi times frequency, and frequency is 1 over period. So 2 pi over the period and this period for uh, Earth's rotation is one day. So, so I think uh, uh, these are numbers I can plug in as we are working out the numerical value of the answer. So I, let's just uh, uh, get an algebraic expression for our orbit and we can, uh, I'll use Wolfram Alpha to plug in numbers. I see a couple constants whose numbers I don't really want to look up. <laughs> let's let, uh, Wolfram Alpha do it. So I'm going to collect all the R orbit on the left-hand side, collect everything else on the right-hand side, and then because R orbit will be cubed, take a cube root. So R orbit will be equal to the cube root of uh, G times M divided by omega squared. So let me plug the numbers into Wolfram Alpha. We have uh, r orbit, uh, which will be gravitational constant times uh, Earth mass divided by, uh, and I have to write out omega, 2 times pi divided by 1 day squared, all of that to 1 third power for cube root. Uh, yeah, let's check how Wolfram Alpha understood my input. That looks good, I think. Uh, oh, okay, it had a bit of an issue. It didn't quite put the day on the correct side of the, the fraction. So extra parentheses to make sure it puts the day on the correct side. Okay, there it is. Um, so it says the radius of the orbit should be equal to, um, so 42,240 40, kilometer. Um, that sounds like a large value. And if you look up the Earth radius, Earth radius is uh, less than that, uh, much less than that. It's, uh, uh, so in terms of kilometers, 6,371 kilometer. Now it's less, <laughs> but it's significant enough that when they're asking for the altitude, we have to subtract this out. So let's say we're gonna take the num answer we had before, and then we'll subtract on Earth radius. That'll give us what it should be. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's, so the answer that they're looking for for the altitude will be 35,860 kilometers. It's a pretty, um, it's fairly hot. It's, uh, um, uh, it, it's uh, far enough. I think there are some communication networks that are built uh, on geosynchronous satellites, and one of their limitations is latency because of the speed of light delay over this long distance. Yeah. Just an engineering factor. 
uh, Starlink uses a low Earth orbit satellite precisely for that reason, but it needs more number of satellites to make sure that every spot on Earth is covered all the time. So can a geosynchronous satellite be placed over the North Pole, South Pole? Uh, I think the intended answer here is no. Uh, the way I was e explaining how you can only place it over uh, the red the equator. But I think in uh, aerospace engineering, there's a um, word they use for uh, things that are like in this orbit, but over the poles. There are satellites on that trajectory, I think. I don't think they call it geosynchronous. I'm not sure what they call it. <laughs> Low Earth orbit is orbit around the Earth just outside the atmosphere. What is the period of an object in a low Earth orbit? So um, this is an interesting question where we can actually go back and use an expression that we rolled out earlier. We can go back to this expression and use this for the gravitational force. Because the thing is, they didn't give us the distance of low Earth orbit. You know, it can be anywhere between like 100, 150 kilometers to a few hundred kilometers. I think the uh, International Space Station is at 200 kilometers, I think, maybe. Might be a factor of two. Look it up yourself. <laughs> um, so within that distance, so, you know, if it's hundreds of kilometers, it's uh, much less than our Earth radius of 6,000 kilometers. So this would be reasonably good approximation. So we can use this for gravitational force and work out what the period would be. So let me write a version of the, these equations that has substituted this thing for the gravitational force. So that's going to be the acceleration of our Earth omega squared is equal to the right-hand side, force divided by n will be g. Okay, so I think I still need to know our Earth. And let me write out what omega squared is so that I can uh, write, uh, get an algebraic expression for period. So, um, so our Earth times omega, I wrote that out here, 2 pi over t squared is equal to g. Okay. Um, just trying to do the algebra in my head. <laughs> I'm going to have t squared to the right, everything else to the left. Flip them around for t squared is equal to uh, 4 pi squared r earth divided by g. Uh, take the square root for the period itself. Okay, let's plug that into O from alpha and see what we get. Uh, oh, I already have our three ideas here. So square root of 4 times pi squared times our three ideas divided by O. Uh, gravitational acceleration. I think you will understand that. What's it? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Earth equal to real already. But yeah. yeah, so the it gives us a few different units. I guess this is the most convenient to, to memorize. About eighty minutes. So um, something like a international space station. It, it'll so if you are somehow in the space place where overhead you will see it, it'll come around every eighty minutes. So super fast because it's a, at a closer orbit. Oh, and it's a demonstration of Kepler's third law <laughs> that you'll be learning this week. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, um, so that's a lower Earth orbit. So you have a period that's a, equal to about 84 minutes. These are kind of good uh, number sense numbers to know. Uh, you know, a geosynchronous orbit is kind of large. <laughs> a low Earth orbit period is kind of short. 